Welcome to this live edition of Spreester Sessions, Generation Under Fire. What we're about to talk about is a hot button issue. If I didn't know that before we announced tonight's topic, I know it now. But when you think about it, why wouldn't it be? We're talking about safety, schools, and our children. And yes, guns are part of the discussion, but not the focus tonight. It's a discussion that some don't want to have because it usually pits so-called gun lovers versus gun haters, sometimes painted as a black and white issue. Well, it is anything but. There's a lot of gray in there when you start to talk about this topic. So that's what we're going to do tonight. A respectful conversation about safety in our schools. No name calling or yelling, and yes, I'm confident we can pull it off. I'd love for you to also be part of this discussion on KSAT's social media platforms. Give us your questions, and we may just use them tonight during this discussion. We begin the conversation, though, with a group of people that seem to be at the forefront of this issue in America. High school students. Spreester Sessions begins right now. Oh my God. The fearful moment. Gunshots rang out at a high school in Southern Florida. At least 17 dead, 14 injured and taken to local hospitals. No child, no teacher should ever be in danger in an American school. No parent should ever have to fear for their sons and daughters when they kiss them goodbye in the morning. And we can change the laws in this country, but we need to become an activated democracy. Since February 14th, their calls to action have mobilized an entire generation. Students at schools across the country are staging walkouts and protests. One of the unsafest places in the world are gun-free zones. These school shootings continue to happen in gun-free zones. From L.A., Dallas, Boston, and New York City, we need to keep fighting until gun control happens. This is why we are all here today, to make the message and be heard. In this point in time, we need to be the most strong because it's up to us to stand up for ourselves. Now that our politicians aren't doing their jobs. And our intent for this march is to let people know that what's going on nowadays, especially in schools, is not okay. I'm thrilled to have this discussion tonight with four members of the San Antonio High School community. Joining us, first off, Miranda Alonzo from MacArthur High School, a senior. Miranda, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Kylie Strain, MacArthur High School student as well. Thank you. Kenny Strawn from Lee High School, and Bailey Reagan, also from MacArthur High School. So I said the ladies from Mac and Kenny, so we've got it, we've got it covered tonight. Yeah. The big purpose of this discussion, I think, is to just have a discussion. There are so many people that don't even want to talk about this subject on both sides of the issue. So I want to thank all four of you for being here to talk about that. Thank you for Miranda, you've been kind of my go-between on this. You were on KSAT 12. You and Kylie and, Reg and Bailey were all here. Uh, and you talked about the fact that you guys kind of stepped outside of your comfort zone and, and took action. What did you guys decide to do in this? So uh, we were kind of pushed by a discussion in one of our English classes about death and how prevalent it is in society. Um, we were studying Hamlet, and in that play, death is so normal to all the characters. Um, and for us, the day that the Parkland shooting happened, we realized that death is normal to us. You know, as a generation, we've become desensitized to it. So made me mad, um, and it made a lot of us mad, so we decided that enough was enough, and we saw the Parkland kids mobilizing, and we said, well, you know, hey, from Texas, we're coming, you know, we're on the way. Yeah. Kylie, no doubt that you guys were inspired by what happened in Parkland and then the reaction from the students there. Yeah, we were super inspired, and we just, we wanted to have a say and have them know that we support them fully and that we're here and that they're... Um, cry for helps like they need to be heard um, that politicians and that they need to hear us yeah, so you sent out letters, you had a petition for change I think is what you called it, you sent letters out 
uh, to the basically local politicians and government officials telling them you wanted things to change. Is that yes. correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we collected about 15 letters is the ending we got. Um, we collected all those letters from students from different high schools in NEIC. I have a friend in Austin who even wrote a letter. Um, and I was able to read all of them because uh, I was kind of the spearhead of it. And reading all the letters, the collective decision that I heard was, we're scared. Um, you know, it's happening all around us. It's not even just in schools. It's, it's a general thing, you know, fear for your life as you walk to the grocery store. There's people out there who have these heinous crimes in their heads and, you know, what's being done to stop them? It was the collective question, I guess, that we faced. Yeah. Kenny, you're, you're not from MacArthur, you're from Lee High School, but I know you took part in the local March for Our Lives. Where do you come down on this issue? Do you feel safe in schools? Safe in your school? In my school, unfortunately I don't. And I think that's the sad reality of America today. I, I think most high school students don't feel safe in their own schools. And, and that, that, that's sad. That's sad to say I, I should be able to go to my high school, my place of learning, and I should just be able to only worry about my learning. I, I shouldn't have to worry if the kid behind me is going to pull out a gun from his backpack and start shooting. I, I shouldn't have to worry about that. But you do. But I do. Yeah. Bailey, you asked for some sort of change to happen right. in those letters. G give me specifics. What do you want to see happen? So. Basically, the change that we're hoping for is one that people take notice and take action, um, that they raise their voices and don't just sit here in silence and keep letting these events occur until that one event happens that pushes us over the edge. Why are we sitting here waiting for that? Why don't we take action now? Um, I think we really want change in our schools for the safety of the students, for the teachers, all of the faculty. Um, I think that the schools aren't fairly equipped with the everything that we need to protect ourselves from school shootings to happen. I know personally in our school we only have one police officer to manage a whole campus. Um, we also want a focus on mental health and attacking it and noticing it at a young age because it does occur in four year olds and higher. Like we need to focus on the mental health and young young children in our society so that it doesn't advance to a point where they feel the need that they need to take out their anger on people that they're close to in their schools. So you just mentioned more officers on campus, right. more security officers, and mental health. Yes. I think before I even did this, I know before I even did this interview, most people would have said, well, you guys are just focusing on guns. It's not, guns. It's not no. just about guns no. at all. Gun control as a whole has components to it. And I mean, you know, you can focus on background checks, you can focus on mental health, you can focus on guns in general and the sale of them. But the biggest issue is what are we doing to pinpoint the real problem? No one is really, you know, no one wants to open the discussion. It's an it's an uncomfortable discussion. I mean, yeah. I'm 17 and I've been around guns my whole entire life. They don't scare me as a topic. The topic that scares me is that someone who is mentally ill can have a gun. Mm -hmm. That scares me personally. I think yeah. it's also important not to stigmatize those with mental illnesses, though. Exactly. You know, mm -hmm. not, not everyone with mental illness wants to shoot up a school exactly. or feels that he or feels the anger and rage that you go to school. And I, I just really think that's important to say. Well, I, and I also, I also really want to hit this again. I mean, gun control is not the most important issue to you guys. That's right. Correct. I mean, I'm guessing because I was confronted, I mean, I actually had somebody on my Facebook page say, well, I hope you're not going to interview any kids. That's the whole. Thing. I mean, so I'm guessing. So I'm guessing. So I'm guessing. I'm guessing, I'm guessing you guys have faced some of that as well. Oh, oh my Is that right, gosh. Kylie? I mean, Kyle, let's go, let's start with Kylie here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Um, I was telling um, 
a uh, supervisor of mine, and I was saying, oh yeah, we're doing another um, segment on KSI. He was like, oh, so you just want to take all the guns away? And I was telling him right before the interview, that's not what we're here for. That's not what we want. Like, we we're not trying to take away the guns. Like, Second Amendment, totally for it. Concealed carry, like. Yes, um, it's our right, but the fact that that's the stereotype that teenagers have and that goes along with the left side, like, that's not where we're here for. It's the mental issue, mental, sorry, mental... Um, mental health. Yes, mental yeah. health. Um, that's what we want to focus on and just the, wanting to feel safe um, going to school, going anywhere that... Uh, someone with that mental health shouldn't be able to get a gun so easily, such as the guy from um, Nicholas Cruz in the Florida shooting. He, the Baker so, Act, and we were talking about this before um, we came on air. You yeah. <laughs> um, a Florida law that was enacted in 2017, it's the Baker Act, um, and it's a 72-hour hold, and a lot of states have a similar thing. I don't know what Texas is. Uh, stance on it is, but um, if a, it's a, coin, a court appointed 72 hour hold on a citizen who is a, you know, a threat to themselves or a threat to society. Mm -hmm. um, the Parkland shooter was not Baker acted, but he showed all the signs, signs right. of violent mental illness um, and he wasn't Baker acted. So there it is, there's the conversation. Mental health awareness is on the table in Florida. It's on the table in all 50 states. We're not really talking about it. We're brushing past it and saying, we're doing something, but we're not really attacking the issue. And that's where, as a whole country, we're falling behind. Yeah. Kenny, I mean, you and I talked before. Uh, you are a hunter. Yeah. You grew up with guns from a young age. Yeah. Your, your take on, on this whole thing. Yeah, so I I consider myself a responsible gun owner uh, as does the rest of my family consider themselves responsible gun owners. However, we all feel that maybe, maybe owning an assault rifle or an AR-15 isn't necessary for a hunter or isn't necessary at all. And I, like, I don't know, you, you said it yourself, there's a lot of gray area here. There's a lot of gray area on everything that we're talking about today. But one thing that is for certain is that we need to be talking about this. We need to have more than just a local conversation, more than just a statewide conversation, even more than just a national conversation. This needs to be a conversation where everyone in the world can talk about it, not just having to do with laws in America, not just having to do with how American culture acts about guns, acts about violence. It needs to be something the whole world can come together and sit down and say, okay, the world has a violence issue. What can we do to solve it? Yeah. Bailey, um, in other places, including Parkland, they've uh, put the clear, black, clear backpacks in action, um, talks of metal detectors, talks of walls are we, we're also talking about a fine line here between school safety and making your schools feel like a prison are we not yes there is a very fine line between that um, and I think that there that line can still stand like we don't have to turn schools into a prison and have everybody walking through metal detectors and having clear backpacks and having this like a pat down before you go to class like that also shouldn't be a requirement because that's going to make people not want to go to school also. Like feeling like, oh, another day at school, another day in prison. That's already um, thought by many students. And I feel like to tackle the issue, it's not to put it on the students and say, oh, well, you can't be trusted, so we're going to search every aspect of you in your life to make sure that you're not going to bring a weapon into our school. I think that they should handle it, again, with the mental health. And make sure and check in on their students and make sure that they're OK, because Mental health problems go unnoticed for years, and it does, like I said, start at a young age. And I feel like if we attack that at the base of the issue, then we wouldn't have to get to the point of installing metal detectors and clear backpacks 
in our schools. A lot of criticism about the uh, March for Our Lives movement, a lot of criticism personally for some of the kids that have been at the forefront of this whole thing. Have you guys felt any of that being as public as you are? Yes, sir. <laughs> in what ways, Miranda? Um, you know, I am on the same, I'm on the same wave. My family is all responsible gun owners. Um, and we got a lot when we were first on case app uh, of like, oh, you know, come and take it. You know, you're gonna take my guns away. You're here to just, you know, be completely left wing, da da da. All of that politicized conversation. Um, that's really what we got was that scrutiny um, and the stigmatism behind gun control. Um, that's really what we felt, and it's kind of one of those things where it's like, no, we're not all here to take guns away. Yeah. yeah, and that's what I'm really hoping to do with this conversation is take down some of those barriers and yeah. some of the assumptions that people make about other people on both sides of this issue. I, I want to play a soundbite now. Uh, this is Stephen Williford. He was involved uh, and basically ran off the shooter in Sutherland Springs that was shooting up the First Baptist Church. He talked last week uh, at a reception uh, that John Cornyn was having, talking about uh, a new law that he did, that he passed to kind of back, uh, close the loophole on uh, domestic abusers getting guns. Let's listen to this, this soundbite from Steve Williford talking about the March for Our Lives cause. Common ground as far as uh, dealing with mental illness and dealing with the background checks, making sure that the bad guys don't get guns and stuff. If they would find common ground with training teachers and, and putting metal detectors up at the doors of schools and stuff, that would be common ground that would make a difference. All right, that was Stephen Williford talking about how he can find common ground with some of the youth that have been out there in front, not so much on gun control, but on other issues. Your, your reaction to what he had to say, Bailey? Um, I feel like if people just realize that as young adults, we are ignorant and uneducated on gun control and how guns impact our society, I feel like we could come to common ground and without the political criticism that comes with talking about guns and guns in our society, I feel like there could be conversations and ways to get past the issue and really grasp what we're trying to do with the movement that we're starting. Yeah, your reaction to what he had to say, Kenny? I, I completely agree. I, I, I think that his statement really just shows that this, this I kind of group, group of issues having to deal with gun violence is something that it surpasses generations. People talk to each other about it, and it's something that we can all relate to. You know, just uh, just before today's interview, I had I was talking with Johnny, uh, the gun instructor, who's going to be on here in a couple of minutes, and we just kept talking and talking and talking, and it became clearly obvious that even though we're from two different generations, uh, two different backgrounds, we have a lot of common ground, especially on these issues. Yeah, I'm I'm struck by the fact that he basically said what you guys were talking about moments ago. Mm -hmm. Kyle, I mean, he was talking about mental health, mm -hmm. talking about metal detectors. We didn't necessarily talk about metal detectors, but we can talk about metal detectors. Um, and, and, but he was really hitting home on the mental health to make sure bad guys don't get guns. Exactly. Yeah. Did you take that from him too? That you, you already feel some common ground there? Yes, um, I definitely feel that. I think that even from both sides of the spectrum that we can both agree that something has to be done. Maybe we don't agree with how it should be, but the fact that we're talking about it and that everyone's aware of it, like even that's progress, that's something. Um, this movement isn't just one-sided. It's something that we want everyone to agree with and maybe you won't. There's obviously gonna be people who don't, but um, that the mental illness, the side that we're not trying to take away the guns, um, that just, we need people to talk about it. Um, I definitely don't. Yeah, what do you, your reaction, Miranda? I asked everybody else their reaction to what Mr. Williford had to say. Um, he really reminds me of my grandpa. <laughs> um, it's just kind of one of those things that, like Kenny said, it's a, it's across the generations. I mean, we're all, we're all Americans, and you know, we're all living coherently. We're all together, um, 
and there's no way that we're going to come to that common ground if people on both sides of the aisle don't start looking at people like us and like the kids from Parkland who are saying, hey, we're not here to say we're Republican, we're Democrat, we're just here to say we're people who are frightened and the lawmakers are the ones that can help us. And I think that even he would agree with us in saying they can help us more than we can help them. And they're going to be able to help the general populace. So yeah. Do you feel like this is a movement that's, that's going to go away? I mean, you have things planned. I, we do. <laughs> we do definitely have things planned. I, I don't think this is going to go away. Um, I, this has inspired me to take it into my adult life. Um, I think that this is a springboard year for me um, in that a lot of change is going to happen for me in the next year, you know, going to college and things like that, all four of us actually. Um, it's really changed my perspective on what I want to do in life and kind of given me a new fire for change in my society more than I've ever had before. So if I'm feeling that, I know that they're feeling that. And I know that, you know, the students from Parkland are definitely feeling that as well. Um, and I don't think that we're going to be put out. I really don't. Yeah. All right. Show of hands. Um, of the four of you, how many of you do not feel safe at school? Okay. Show of hands, how many of you think metal detectors are a good idea at school? None of you. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, and what, how many of you think clear backpacks are a good idea at school? How many of you are in favor of a waiting period for gun for gun purchases? Okay. I just I just you know I'm trying to I'm trying to tease out some of the specifics here where there are differences. Uh, and, you know I and I my I'm just I'll speak for my generation. We didn't have this when I was a kid. We didn't have the publicized school shootings. We didn't have the Aurora Theater shooting. We didn't have the Sutherland Springs shooting. I mean, I did not grow up with, the, with these things happening. And is that, do you think that's kind of lost to some of the other generations, just what you guys are, the, the environment yes, you guys are growing up in? Is. Yes. Yeah, talk about it a little bit, Dale. So I know for generations before us, um, like you said, it wasn't an issue. So for us growing up with being either involved in school shootings, having to go through that, um, hearing about them, seeing them on social media, anything like that. It's, it's heartbreaking, but it gets to a point where you are desensitized from it, and then the next school shooting just becomes the next school shooting, and you just get, your fear of for your life at your school just increases exponentially, because your school could be next. Somebody could get, an idea or motivation, sadly, from seeing a tragedy happen, and then they want that publicity for themselves, and so they would take action to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like the generations before us don't can't really grasp that because y'all did not live through it. Um, and it's I'm curious to see how y'all view this um, based on how we do, because like I said, we're desensitized to it. And I know some adults react to it in negative ways. Some adults react and they're very like, dumbfounded by it and they don't know really how to react because we're children and we're dying because of guts. And that's just, you can't really wrap your mind around that. Yeah, we got, we got a question, like I said, that we're showing this on all of KSAT's social media platforms. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that we got is from Wendy let me pull it back up here on my Apple Watch here. Um, Miranda, I'll give you this question. Wendy wants to know, and we can each of you can answer it. Wendy wants to know, how would they feel being in school if teachers were allowed to have guns? Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> okay, Wendy, well. <laughs> um, today, I was on my phone in class, and my teacher yelled at me for being on my phone. Um, and then someone else was talking behind us, and I got yelled at again for talking when I was quietly putting my phone away. So my teacher yelling at another student's action, she was yelling at me. I'm just going to put that out there. I don't know yeah. if anybody caught on. Yeah. Um, you know, teachers are 
wonderful human beings who have dedicated their lives to educating the next generation. They are, they're God's gift to us. I, I genuinely believe that. Um, all, of the teachers that I've, all of the teachers that I've had have been super impactful in my life, um, even the teachers that I necessarily didn't enjoy. Um, but you can't ask that of a mother or a father because most of them are. All teachers view their students as their children. You can't ask that of them. Yeah. Um, I mean, would you be able to point a gun at one of your students? Yeah. Kylie, the, the, the bigger question is, what if there's a teacher that wants to be armed? So, okay, I, I'm kind of flipped on this because um, I agree with the fact that I personally would feel safer on campus knowing that there is a teacher or a couple teachers but i personally don't want to know which teacher that is okay um i don't i think that it should be concealed but then the fact that if they have to lock it away in a safe or something in their desk lock it up by the time that they get it i mean you don't know how much time has passed how many students have been in danger by then um i like the idea of it per se but the whole idea that I wouldn't want to know what teacher it is. I wouldn't want another student finding out, oh, well, this teacher has a gun. I wouldn't feel safe knowing which one it was. I, was, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Kenny, your thoughts, on, your thoughts on teachers with guns. And let's just say it's not, it's not mandated, but if a teacher mm -hmm. wants to have a concealed carry weapon on school property, your thoughts on that? I'd say, um, well, two things. I feel like they're police officers on campus for a reason. And I feel like if these police officers are armed and they are able to get to the side of the shooting, then they should be the first line of defense. But there is also those cases in which they aren't, in which a teacher may be the first line of defense. And there, I do completely understand the argument that some teachers should be armed. And I think I, I would have to agree. You know, I, I would not want to know the teacher that is armed. I would not. This is really only if the teacher wants to be on it. I, I, you don't think it should be mandatory? I don't think it should be mandatory. I, 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 I think they're, like I said, they're police officers on campus for a reason. It's their job to protect people. But at the same time, I feel as though if a school wants to allow people to carry guns on campus, or allow teachers, excuse me, to carry weapons on campus, yeah. and that teacher has gone through the certification, has gone through the 20-hour class that it takes to get an active shooter certification, then I, I feel like I'd be more comfortable with that yeah. than just right. a teacher being a hand weapon. Yeah. Bailey, let me ask you, because you brought up the fact you have one officer on mm -hmm. campus and you're not okay with that. Mm -hmm. Are you okay with teachers that want to go through the certification getting certified and carrying a weapon on campus? I am okay with teachers that want to do that for themselves. Um, I do not think it should be needed. I think that especially teachers that are ex-military or they have some form of background handling guns and being an active shooter um, and then they would like to have that choice to have a gun on their person, they should be allowed to do that. I also agree with Kylie, I would not want to know who it is. Um, I would not want, honestly, any other, anybody else to know who the teacher was that had the gun. Yeah. Um, just because of the safety of keeping it locked up, whether the student finds it. Um, but I do not think that teachers need to be armed um, if they do not want to. Want to, to be. Mm -hmm. All right, quick question, because I want to make sure I get all of the people that are watching this, there they have questions. Uh, Josiah asks, given that mass shootings are incredibly rare and a statistical anomaly, don't you think the focus is in the wrong place? What would you say to somebody like Josiah? I, I don't think it's in the wrong place. I, I think I think this is this is in fact the right place to have this conversation because unfortunately it, it does happen. And while they are statistical anomalies, I feel as though it's becoming too often that I hear about a mass shooting happening. And I I shouldn't I, I, I can go for a week without hearing about a mass shooting, but I, I can't because, the, because I do hear about it. I would like to be able to go a week without hearing about a mass shooting, but I'm not able to because of 
because they happen. And while they are statistical anomalies, we also need to define what mass shooting is. If mass shooting is more than two people, then it happens a lot more often than a mass shooting where it's just one person, or is that even a mass shooting? Or if no one dies, is that a mass shooting? It's, like you said, there's, there's a lot of gray here. And the focus is in the right place, and the movement is where it needs to be. And by using, and by the Parkland students using their platform and using their voice to organize this movement around this terrible, terrible tragedy, I mean, props to them. They're incredibly brave. And I look forward to seeing what they do in the future. Miranda. I have something to say. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't think that the focus is in the wrong place. I think that the word mass shooting is way too easily used. Um, Parkland could be deemed as a mass shooting. I couldn't tell you if mass shooting means one person or three people or 17. Uh, I think that just the conversation needs to be open about shooting and gun violence in general. Um, and you know, you can't necessarily say mass shooting because just a few weeks ago there was another school shooting that wasn't deemed a mass shooting in Maryland. Yeah. So I mean, it's just about gun violence in general. It's sure. not about mass shootings. All right. To wrap up this segment before we get to the police chief and the SAISD superintendent and the concealed handgun instructor, I'm going to ask each of you, just give me like a closing thought. What you would like to, what you really wanted to get across in this conversation. And uh, we'll go right to left this time, Bailey. Okay. I'll, start, I'll start with you. Awesome. Bailey Reagan, <laughs> senior at MacArthur High School. What do you hope people get out of this conversation? I hope people hear us when we speak about the fact that we don't want to take the guns away. We just want some control on it in the aspect of mental health and background checks and stuff like that. We're not trying to get rid of guns completely. Um, we're just asking for people to stand up and take notice and protect us as children, as young adults, as people in society. We should be protected. We should feel like we are safe when we go to school. We should feel like we're safe when we leave the presence of our home. And I'm asking that people take action towards that and speak up and protect each other in society like we should be. Thank you, Bailey. Kenny Strawn, senior at Lee High School. What would you say? What do you want people to take from this? What I want people to take from this is right now there is a revolution going on. Young people, whether they're on the left side of the aisle, whether they're on the right side of the aisle, whether they're right there in between, they're becoming more politically active than, than ever. And that's an extremely good thing for not just for voter turnout, but for movements and causes like March for Our Lives, where this most of the time in history a terrible, terrible event will happen and people will rally behind a cause for real change. And I think that's what we're seeing. I, I think we're seeing the very beginning of real change start to happen, and it's being led by young people, people our age, and I, that's, that's incredible to me. I never thought I'd see the day, but here we are. Yeah. Bailey Strain? Bailey Strain? No, <laughs> Kylie Strain. Sorry, Kylie. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Kylie Strain, your thoughts. So my thoughts. Um, the facts that mental illness, that the facts that you don't, you don't have to wait that long to get a gun, the facts that the Florida Baker Act, that Nicholas Cruz showed all the signs of suicidal um, attempts, that he attempted suicide and that he had um, violence um, in his home, that he attacked his mom, that he had all of these signs and that they weren't detected or that they were but they were ignored um, but he was still able to obtain a mass amount of guns especially semi-automatics not even those like I'm not trying to say that um, all the shootings are semi-automatics um, AR-15s the one in Maryland was a pistol um, so I'm not just saying a certain type of gun um, but I'm saying that the mental illness of it all needs to be it needs to be more strict, that we need to have people listen to us, that politicians seem to listen to us, that um, we're not ignorant to this and that we did grow up with this, that we know what we're talking about. Um, that's what I have to say. Yeah. 
And news anchors need to pay more attention to your first name, right? That's it. Yeah. That's yeah. it. That's, yeah. that's, that's a hot one. I know. My, ap my apologies, I Kylie. My apologies. I just I, I got a Kylie, a Bailey, and a Kenny. So I know. you know, it's, it's all just messed up. Yeah. And a Randy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Miranda Alonzo, senior MacArthur High School. What do you want to leave people with? We have the right to bear arms. Um, it's just how we do it that matters. Um, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna stop until something changes. Um, and enough is enough. Great. Thank you all for sharing Thank part you. of your story. I really appreciate it. Before we transition to our next panel. I want to set it up by talking about, we talked about schools and teachers possibly going through some of that training. Well, it is already happening. As we take the video, we can tell you it's a job that uh, he's been doing for years, but what he teaches is put him squarely in the spotlight when it comes to active shooters and school safety, and more teachers are using his services. Johnny Castro Jr. is a licensed to carry instructor who is one of only 23 active shooters or school safety instructors in the state at a place to shoot. He trains and certifies teachers under the state curriculum. One of his latest students teaches at a local elementary school. She asked not to be identified, but sought out this kind of training, which is more in depth than concealed carry training. There's a lot of steps to take, and there's, there's a lot involved. And God forbid it happened at my school, and God forbid it happened to one of my kids, and I have to pass up my child to get that active shooter. Because if not, he's going to kill more, more students. Arming teachers, not something everyone agrees with. By the way, the state of Texas requires licensed carry holders attend six hours of classes. The state school safety curriculum, 20 hours of class time, and they have to shoot at a higher proficiency on target testing than just the regular concealed handgun licenses. I am joined now by Johnny Castro Jr., who is that instructor that we talked about earlier, and Pedro Martinez, who is the superintendent of the San Antonio Independent School District, and Police Chief William McManus. Go ahead, Chief, and take a, take a seat. Thank you all for being with us. Um, Johnny, I want to start with you. Y you heard some of the students talking. I saw you talking with them earlier. And you talked to me, and I was struck by why you wanted to be here tonight. Well, I want to get the message out to the people that, you know, we, we need to have a solution. Uh, I'm a grandfather. I work in the business of guns. Uh, I train people. Uh, and me and my wife have uh, countless discussions in the evening about our grandkids going to school. I want the same that these, these uh, young folks are talking about. I want them to grow up also to be able to go to school and feel free and have a great time at life while they're growing up just like we did back in our days. And so it's very important for me also to get the education out there because knowledge is power. A lot of the things that they were saying today, there's what I do uh, with the School Safety uh, Act, uh, Senate Bill 1857, covers a lot of that where it allows the teachers to carry if they want. It does not force them. It's on a volunteer uh, basis. But the proficiency and the requirements and the skill set is way uh, at the top. Uh, 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 and, and not what typical people think it is. It's not just handing out a license and letting somebody carry a gun. Right. They have to pass certain hurdles before they're going to get that gun and be able to carry it on the school campus. Yes, many, many, many hurdles, yes. Yeah. Do you, were you struck at all by anything that the kids said? I mean, did they surprise you in some way? Well, the maturity level, first of all, <laughs> you know, uh, they're trying to, and they are going to make a difference. Uh, and again, I, I see myself in them in, in that, you know, they're looking, and, and I wish they could go back to the days when I was going to school they should have that same platform to be able to go and just enjoy life. And so I'm on this end, I'm not desensitized neither. When we hear these reports, uh, it, it hits me deep. And I'm like, it shouldn't be happening. It shouldn't be happening. They should be focused on education. They should be focused on enjoying life uh, and planning for the future. Instead, just like Kenny said, you know, I don't feel safe at school. 
I don't feel safe at school, and that's uh, that's that's hard to hear, uh, especially from a dad and a grandfather. Do you? I talked to them about how they were kind of you know, you you talk about a student that's involved in you know the March for Our Lives, some of these other things, and you have a certain assumption that maybe some people make about those students. Flip the coin over. You're a concealed handgun license instructor. You work daily with guns. Do people make certain assumptions about you that maybe they shouldn't? I'm pretty sure they do. I mean, uh, you know, the demonic gun, you know. Uh, and again, what we do is we train people. What I do is I train people on a place to shoot. We focus on uh, uh, empowering them with knowledge. Uh, these are law-abiding citizens. Uh, we also have to make decisions as an instructor. Uh, not just as a licensed uh, uh, DPS instructor, but an active school safety instructor, I have to look at the personality of the individual I'm dealing with and make a decision. If I see any kind of telltale signs that uh, something's wrong with this individual, I'm um, that first line that can start making a difference there. And, and even when we sell a gun to a person, there's a lot of stuff that we look for, a lot of body language, a lot of questions that we ask. Uh, and our employees are held uh, uh, to be accountable for, for, for that gun purchase. Yeah, I appreciate you being here, Johnny. Thank you. Thank you for having me. San Antonio Police Chief William McManus, thank you for joining us. I don't know if you heard a little bit of what the, what the students were talking about, but just the fact that I was even going to have this discussion in certain circles, people were not happy about. From your perspective, what's the importance of talking about school safety? I mean, there, there has to be a value in at least broaching the subject, isn't there? Well, I think at the very least it gives, <clears throat> excuse me, I think at the very least it gives the students a chance to vent and express their opinions about school safety. Yeah. Um, after all, it is, it is happening across the, across the country, uh, school shootings, and uh, who better to give their opinion than, than the students? What do you think about school safety? And when you hear, I mean, your job is to protect and serve, and you hear some of these kids saying they don't feel necessarily safe in school. And, and that's unfortunate. I have, I have three kids in school myself. I know you do, yeah. Um, and that's unfortunate. Um, but I think just, just to, to branch out a little bit from yeah. this conversation, it's not just schools that, that are concerned about active shooters. This can happen in any public venue anywhere in this country, and it has. So it, it's, I know we're focusing on schools, but it's, but it's more about uh, any public venue. The society in general. <clears throat> society in general. Yeah, what, what would you say to people who are concerned about school safety? What would you say to these, to these kids? Well, let, let, let me talk about one of the issues, and, and, and I like the way Miranda put it. Um, she said that she is, that, that we have a right to our Second Amendment. Uh, right, right to bear arms. Right to bear right. arms. Um, and she said that if teachers want to be armed, then they should be allowed. She wouldn't have any problem with that. And, and I would agree with that. Yeah. San Antonio Independent School District Superintendent Pedro Martinez, thank you for being with us as well. You're, I'm curious what your initial reaction is when there are uh, four students that are sitting up there, not from SAISD schools, but right. four San Antonio students that are sitting up here and there's, they say they're not, they don't feel safe in school. Is that, are you surprised by that? I'm not surprised, and, uh, but first of all, I wanna say I am inspired by just not only what our students uh, today that, that are representing our San Antonio high schools, students across the nation from Parkland and everywhere else. You, you know, and what I love is that the conversation is happening. Uh, you know, recently it's become so polarizing to tackle any political issue and it, is, it no longer is, you know, it basically, if people don't agree, they don't even want to talk about it. And for me, I, I, I love the fact that to be a superintendent in th at this time, when I'm watching students model for adults the way to have a conversation, the way to bring up topics and issues, and frankly, call adults on the carpet when, when they're trying to pull either, either make, make a conversation political or trying to uh, avoid the issue. So first of all, uh, you know, I applaud our students. It, it does concern me quite a bit that um, our students don't feel safe. I'm not surprised by it. Uh, when you look at the fact that uh, police shooting uh, or shootings that are happening across our country are happening on a regular basis, it is not an anomaly. 
Um, and, and, so for, and so when you see stories, whether, and the chief is right, it's not just in schools, it's in public spaces right. as well. I think as a parent, as a superintendent, I'm very concerned. Uh, we have in our high schools two officers in every high school. We have an officer in every comprehensive middle school. Um, and, and even then, you know, I still worry about, uh, because most of our campuses are open campuses. Uh, they have multiple buildings. Uh, and we're always concerned about do we have all the safety precautions that we need to? Uh, do we have the right security systems? And, and so in those are areas, frankly, with public schools that we don't get sufficient funding to be able to put those things in place. Uh, we don't get uh, enough support for mental health services. And I, and I really love the fact that students are talking about mental health. The reality is that, especially when you live in poor neighborhoods, uh, crisis and mental health issues, and the chief probably sees this in, in his work, are, are, are just significant. And many times they're unaddressed because of the fact that there's not enough services for these families. There's not enough services for these children. Um, in every one of our districts, we have specialized schools that have children that are in different medications. And I will tell you firsthand, you know, when, when our children are having trouble at home, when children are not on those medications, we see them react and they can be violent. And so for us, these are some things that we face every single day. So, you know, I love the fact that the conversation is about responsible gun control. The conversation is about uh, how do we address mental health issues? Let's stop ignoring them. And let's, let's talk about resources for school districts and schools. So that, and, and, and I'll tell you, you know, the, I love when you, when you ask the question, do our students want metal detectors in every school? Do they want clear backpacks? And they said no. And, and you know, for adults, it's really easy to say, well, put, you know, put metal detectors in every single school. Put uh, clear backpacks in every single school. I started my work in K-12 in the Chicago public school system. And one of the things that would anger me is when I would go to our high schools and I saw so many of them, and I graduated from a high school in Chicago, and I would see uh, these schools that had now had all, you know, they had metal detectors. They had 18 security guards in the school. They had clear backpacks, uh, you know, uniforms that you could, sometimes I couldn't even tell who the boys and the girls were because they looked that sterile. And so for me, I, I felt that's not a good learning environment for students. And so we got to figure out the right solutions. I, and the only way you can do that, you've got to start the conversation. And we've yeah. got to do it in a way where we can hear each other and we can come to some reasonable conclusions because there's going to be common ground. And let's applaud our students. Let's encourage them to use their voice because, again, they're modeling today what we should be doing as adults, having these conversations. Yeah, even if we don't necessarily agree with That's everything right. they say, just the fact they're engaged That's right. is something to celebrate. And they're knowledgeable and they, and they know what they're talking about. When we talk about mental health resources, and you talked about the fact that you need more of them, you will admit we need all public schools. I mean, even the city of San Antonio needs yes. more. I know that Police Chief William McManus, that you've been involved in this and you've won awards for what the city of San Antonio has done. Where do we start with that? So I think, the, first of all, we need to understand that it exists in our community. Um, you know, for me, you know, I, I see because, again, we have speci a specialized school that even has children at a high school age uh, where we serve these children. And just recently, uh, last year, I engaged with a, with a, with a partner, uh, John Woods uh, Charter Academy, that specializes in this work. And not only that, has a network of therapeutic services. And, I, you know, and when I did this, uh, it was interesting, you know, and this was a small group of children, but the parents called me and said, thank you for, for paying attention to our children because these are families that have been struggling every single day uh, because these are children that through no fault of them they were born with, the, with these challenges. And so for us, we need to understand that they exist. By the way, many of our family, many, many individuals that end up homeless tend to be individuals that have mental health issues. Absolutely. And yet it's so easy for us to pass them on the street. It's so easy for us to just ignore them. And then of course, then something happens. Something happens with violence and with guns. And then all of a sudden now we're talking about it. So I think the number one thing is we have to discuss it. We have to understand that we can't ignore it anymore. And because of that, there hasn't been enough resources at the state level, at the national level. Because again, it's been too easy to ignore. In fact, you know, many parts of the country, it, the way you get mental health services, you get arrested. And then they're given to you in prison. That's the way you get mental health yeah. services. That seems like a perfect segue to the police chief. I mean, you've dealt with this. You were. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were arresting a lot of people with mental health challenges and you decided to kind of change the way you approach some of these people. Is that correct? We did. We started a mental health unit years ago and have expanded it over the years uh, to deal with just that issue. Um, part of the problem is that 
unless you are a danger to yourself or others, you're not going to be committed. Uh, you can be emergency detained for 48 hours, the doctors will check you out, and nine times out of ten, you're back on the street because they discover that if you're not a danger to yourself or others, then, then there's no way to hold you. So that, that's part of the problem about having a lot of mentally ill people that are, that are on the streets homeless. But your, your officers undergo training to deal with those people. We have, every officer in this department has crisis intervention training. It's a 40-hour course uh, that teaches them how to deal with people they, are, they suspect are mentally ill or, or are in mental crisis. When you see something like what happened at Parkland, do you look at it from a different lens than say I do or the superintendent or Johnny does? Well, I don't know what lens y'all look at it from. But, well, yeah. But, but talking about metal detectors, talking about clear plastic bags, that's not the solution to stopping shootings in whatever venue you may right. have. Yeah. It, uh, um, you know, nine times out of ten, the shooter is not standing up from his desk, you know, in, in math class and start opening up. It's somebody that comes in from outside, whether it's a, sh whether it's a student that belongs in that school, used to go to the school, or is totally unrelated to the school, but has some sort of beef, and they come in from whatever door they come in, and they open up. So if, if I'm sitting in a metal detector and somebody has a, a mind to shoot, to become an active shooter in that school, guess who's going to get hit first? Yeah. Me. Yeah. So, you know, that's not necessarily the solution. It may, it may make us feel better superficially, but it's not the solution to, the, to, the, to active shooter. When, when you hear the, 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 the work apparently calls to law enforcement about Nicholas Cruz, the shooter in that case, is that kind of a worst case scenario for any police department? Yeah, I, I, you know, any, any kind of active shooter, any type of um, um, act where there's, there's intended to be mass casualties is absolutely a nightmare. And you can, you can ask Chief Manley up in Austin about that. Yeah, yeah, with the bombings, which, which right. you guys were, were also helping out right. with. Yeah. Johnny, let's work on some definitions here because I think a lot, a lot of times when people say, an assault weapons ban or an AR-15 ban or, or whatever. I actually had somebody, um, Jake asked if you could give the definition of an assault weapon, like tell us what an assault weapon is. Well, we use that term just like uh, people walk in, they say, I need a clip for my gun. It's a slang word. It's a uh, girl's work clips, we say in, in, in the gun shop and uh, uh, gun steak magazines. Uh, the assault uh, term carries over, it's automatic rifle. We hear in the military, we see on the games, the video games, we see in the movies, it's assault rifles, assault rifles, and so forth. There's semi-automatic uh, firearms. Uh, there's some that are more stronger. Uh, some are bolt action. Uh, and a lot, just like uh, one of the students was saying uh, in regards to the semi-automatic uh, handgun, it doesn't matter what type of handgun, it's still a gun. And in the wrong hands, uh, it, 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 it takes lives uh, wrongfully. So. In regards to the question, when they say assault rifle, I think, again, if I uh, assault somebody with a, a butter knife, I'm not going to call it an assault uh, butter knife. It just, <laughs> the term is just used wrongly. Yeah. Well, that's why, well, that's why I want to get these definitions out there, and that, I appreciate right. your expertise so automatic on automatic rifle uh, is basically a semi-auto, and it can be fired as fast as the individual can pull the trigger. It doesn't uh, automatically just rotate on Being someone that's involved uh, with gun training, and when somebody, when you hear the words gun control, do you flinch? Do you wince? Do you, I mean, is that, is there just an automatic reaction that you have? Uh, there, I mean, there, there, there's some uh, uh, flinching, but it's not for the fear of, of, of losing the Second Amendment right. Uh, I served my country as a, as a United States Marine. Uh, I value life uh, very much so. But uh, I know that the more that we educate people, and even the students said here, it's not about uh, removing the Second Amendment right. They all enjoy and have seen their, 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 their parents and relatives, and they themselves may end up continuing to maybe hunt or, or even decide to get a firearm. It's about being responsible, and it's about educating. And the people that come to a place to shoot, they look for training. They look, uh, they're responsible. I see doctors come in on a regular basis uh, they come out, they shoot, they enjoy uh, uh, c competition. Um, 
and then some just enjoy just harvesting their own meat and uh, having some uh, good venison sausage and uh, good old pork. Yeah, you're making me hungry now. I haven't eaten yet, so thank you, Johnny. Yeah. For when when I talk about gun control to you, Chief, what do you what what goes through your mind? Does something need to be done? Does something need to be changed when it comes to background checks or certain weapons that should not be allowed on the streets? You know, th this is this is such a hot button issue. Such a hot as button you issue. Know. Yeah. Um, I think that there are gun, there is gun control in place right now. If you are mentally ill, if you are a convicted felon, if you uh, are uh, have a domestic violence uh, conviction on your record, you are not legally allowed to have guns. That's already in place. I'm not sure what more gun control people want. And and if I'm a bad guy, and I'm I'm a convicted felon, or if I have a domestic violence charge on me, um, or if I'm mentally ill, I'm, I can get a gun anywhere. I don't have to buy a gun legally. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it's so easy to buy a gun. You can buy get a straw purchaser. You might know somebody who wants to sell a gun. I mean, it's so easy to get a gun. I, I don't know that more gun control is going to solve anything. If we take an AR-15 off the street, have we solved anything, in your opinion? No. AR-15s are not the only guns out there that are being used by bad people to do bad things. I had somebody, and, and Johnny, you can weigh in on this if you'd like. I went to a gun show with a friend of mine, and we were walking around, and he was showing me the AR-15. And he said, you know, if you're going to defend yourself in your house, this is a horrible weapon to have because it's going to go through maybe the intruder but it's also going to go through the refrigerator and the wall and maybe hit something next to it. He said, you, do, you just want one of these, like a sawed-off shotgun or something like that that's going to put out a big blast. I mean, I hate to be too specific, but it, right. am, I, am I correct in that? Yeah, needless to say, once you fire that off in a confined space, uh, your ears are going to be ringing. You're going to lose your equilibrium. Uh, you're, going to, you're going to blow your ears out. Uh, so with that being said, it's, not, it's definitely not the, the weapon of choice uh, for, for, for your home protection. Yeah, to defend yourself. Correct. And I want to say on uh, the kids, I was getting back to the, the, the young adults here uh, on the panel, in regards to that uh, Senate bill that's for the uh, school safety, uh, and again, just like the chief said, uh, it's just not happening in schools, it's happening in churches. The last class that I did, it was interesting, the, the demographics, it was a school teacher, it was a businessman, uh, a grandmother and uh, a, a parishioner from one of the church, yeah. uh, one of the churches. And again, their names are not known to anyone. Uh, and so, when they took the course and they looked at it, it, it's affecting everybody. It's not just affecting the schools. And so, it is a problem that needs to be addressed. But again, that particular training, uh, you know, it's been 2013. Uh, it went into law, but it took three years for the alert in the Texas University and uh, DPS to come up with a curriculum. In 2017, they graduated a total of 23 instructors, uh, you know, what, me being one of those. And then uh, now trying to get the word out there. But again, it's not just one where we're just handing out certificates and, uh, you know, uh, just trying to put guns out there. Uh, that's, not the, that's, not, that's not what we're trying to do at all. We're trying to just make sure, again, that the line of defense, we always talk about being proactive. We need to be reactive. Uh, minutes count. And so when you're inside the school and something happens, and like that coach in, in Florida, we don't know the timeline. But when he threw his body in front of those two girls, and I heard that, and I'm thinking about my own grandchildren, I was wondering if that same law that's in Texas today, if he decided to arm himself and had a gun, we would be talking about the heroic coach still alive that stopped a potential massive shooting uh, or, you know, again, we ended up talking about the coach through his own body. He was the trigger. Uh, people say that the, uh, the teachers cannot pull the trigger. They don't have it in them. But when you're seeing mass slaughter, when you're seeing, you know, children getting uh, shot at and just human people, you know, human beings being shot at, uh, your reaction is going to be to just try to, to, to help. And if you're trained and you have the skill set and you've taken the course, then you're going to be prepared and you're going to, you're going to save lives and you're going to put yourself there. Yeah. Superintendent Martinez, your, react, your thoughts on teachers who want to be armed being allowed to be armed on our campuses? So at this time, I don't support that. 
The main reason for that is because I need assurances that those guns are going to be, be able to be put in a safe place, that uh, we won't accidentally have a child be able to get a hold of that gun. Uh, in a public school system, we serve all children. We don't have the ability to say, these children we're not going to serve. And so therefore, I, and, and I have a responsibility to my parents uh, that drop off their children every day or their children come to our schools every day. Uh, and of course, they're going to have different viewpoints. So for me, you know, maybe in the future I could. I need to get some comfort and assurance. And, and part of the challenge right now is that school districts haven't done that. And so you know, my fear is that you know, if, you, if you have more guns on a campus, you can increase the risk significantly. There could be even more, more violence, more shootings. And so therefore, you know, maybe in the future I could, I, but I would need some assurances. And, yeah. and I say that as a father and I say that as, as the superintendent where I have over 50,000 families that are trusting us with their children every day. Yeah, just to make sure there's not unintended consequences right. in this whole thing. It's, right. it, it's just interesting though that you're, st you're still, if I'm hearing you right, you're still open to the idea if some of this can be kind of laid out in how the program would work. I mean, for us, and, and, I, and again, you know, I'm, I'm really, again, my, just being inspired by our students, I think we have to at least be able to at least have conversations about it. Because if we close our minds to everything and make it a black and white issue, as you said earlier, it's not a black and white issue, it's a gray issue. But for me, my first priority right now is I gotta make sure that my children are safe. And right now, without having those kind of assurances, um, it, it makes me very nervous to have any types of guns, unless it's a police officer that's been trained. And I'm, like I said, and we have officers on, on sites, both at high schools and middle schools. Um, but I need to have those assurances. Yeah, all right, we've got some, pe some people that have uh, sent in some questions. Uh, Chief, I think you maybe can answer this one. Carla asks, how do you prove somebody is mentally ill? Who makes that decision? Let's say you, uh, you get somebody off the street who you believe is mentally ill. Who makes the ultimate decision whether they can be committed? The physicians who would examine them at the hospital. Okay, so you take them to university hospital or we, is there? We, we emergency detain them. And well, there's a number of hospitals around that we may okay. take them. There's a, there's a, uh, uh, a, uh, triage point at one of the hospitals where they'll tell us which hospital is the best one to take that person to. Right, so you take them and then one of those physicians will ultimately make the decision whether to sign the order to be committed or not. Yes. And so with the 48 hours I'm guessing is to give them, to give these physicians time to get there and examine this person. Well, yeah, I mean, it's give them time to observe. Yeah, do you, um, have you noted whether that hurdle is, is higher than you would expect or not as high as you would expect when it comes to, uh, I mean, you said committed, I'm guessing also maybe getting some help for these people uh, that are mentally ill. Well, yeah, um, more times than not, as far as I know, and this is anecdotal, Yeah. more times than not, uh, the folks do not get committed. Okay, that's interesting. All right, so somebody, uh, uh, Manuel asked if Superintendent Martinez would feel comfortable if a few veteran teachers or counselors in school had a gun. I don't know if that, I don't know if that, if that changes your perspective it, or not. It doesn't because it, it's, for me, it's, it's less about the individual that would be doing it. it. It's more around our safety procedures because, you know, just me knowing that there could be a gun in, in the school that's not a part of our police officer uh, who, I, who I trust in our schools because they've been trained. Uh, we spend a lot of hours with them, uh, making sure that they have the proper trainings. So for me, I'm, I'm more nervous about just making sure that as a school district, as a school, that we would have those procedures so that I can assure any parent that if we ever decide to do this, that I know that uh, the risk is, is almost zero, that this gun could end up accidentally in a student's hand. Uh, you know, how many stories have we've heard of children whether they're, and, I, and I'm sorry, but you know, I always consider my children, I don't care if they're 18 years old or five years old. Absolutely. They get a, get a, get the, you know, get a hold of a gun and, and they play with it and it accidentally goes off. And so for me, something like that is just very personal because again, that's the commitment I make to my families is that we're gonna keep their children safe. Yeah, all right, and uh, Johnny, this question is for you. And uh, you know, I, I'm wondering if you planted this, but Cynthia wants to know, how do you sign up for Johnny's classes? <laughs> <laughs> well, you so I'll let you. I'll let yeah. you make a make a plug. You, you simply call a place to shoot, uh, and then you schedule that. I wanted to say something in regards to that, in regards to uh, the superintendent. 
me and my wife, we have a lot of discussions uh, because of this business that we're in and, and our grandchildren. Sure. And right before we got on, I was talking to Kenny. And the curriculum and the criteria that we train the teachers on, and again, some of these are veterans. Some of these are retired police officers. There was even an FBI agent that retired as a school teacher. So they're in the schools, and, so, and they're ready to act. And if one of those individuals decided and the school allowed that individual to safeguard his gun, her gun, with the skill set there, the certification, and again, no one knows who that individual is, and God forbid a mass shooting happened in one of the schools where one of our grandchildren was there, and our grandchild got killed by that stray bullet from that individual trying to stop the uh, active shooter, I would live peacefully inside knowing that, you know what, while I still have hurt and I lost my grandson or my granddaughter, the 10 other students are going to be alive today because somebody did something and put that individual in place to safeguard, safeguard the rest of those children. Are you at all surprised, I mean, I don't know what your preconceived notions were coming into this discussion, Johnny, but are, are you surprised that there's as much common ground here? Among, among all of us, it seems. Yes, I am very, very uh, uh, impressed uh, uh, and, and surprised, but impressed on the conversation and the uh, level of the conversation that we're having. Again, it's, uh, I, I thought, I don't know what to really think, but you always, you're always guarded. But it's just immediately these uh, students just, uh, I could relate to them. And I was like going back to my school days and, and I'm looking there and so I want the same thing that I experienced. You know, and so we do have a lot of common ground, and we need to have these discussions. Homeland Security defines what we're talking about today: active shooter is an individual, an individual that's actively engaged in killing as many people in a confined and populated area in a short amount of time. Yeah. And sometimes that teacher, well, not sometimes that teacher will make a difference when it takes a minute to two minutes for that individual to start going down the hallways, and who best? is the one that's taking care of our children every single day, knows the layout of those buildings inside and out. And while the officers, I applaud the officers, they're trying to come back in, figure out we're losing time while they try to make their way in. And every day they put their lives on the line, don't get me wrong. But we need to start looking things a, a little bit different so we can stop uh, the massive uh, loss of life. Yeah, Chief, I know you spend a lot of time out in the community talking to different people and different groups and you know people from different opinions. Were you, are you surprised there's as much common ground on this, it seems, as, as we sit here, at least with the people that are in this room, on these issues? No, I wouldn't say I was surprised, but, but again, it, it is a polarizing issue. I was at the, at the March for Life, uh, and there was, a, there was a lot of people there. Yeah. Uh, as there was in D.C., my, my daughter called me. She's going to a college up there, and she called me and told me that the throngs of people were just unbelievable. Yeah. But, but no, I, I think you'll find a lot of people um, who uh, are on the same plane, but when, when it comes to the marches and the rallies, you know, you're going to find one group or the other. Yeah. Uh, Superintendent Martinez, you, are you surprised we're finding as much common ground? I'm not actually. And in, in fact, you know, when you look at national surveys, what you find is actually a lot of agreement, regardless of which party you represent or which side you're in, around responsible gun ownership, around responsible background checks. Uh, and so for me, I'm not surprised at all. I, I think, like I said, what, I, what I'm inspired by is that what's driving this conversation is students, and students who are not uh, trying to make this a political issue, and that are frankly, again, holding adults accountable who try to make it a political issue, and I love that. Is this a fine line for you, though, as a superintendent, when, let's say, April 20th, they're talking about a national mm -hmm. walkout yeah. at school, is it hard for you as a superintendent to want these kids in their classroom to learn, but also respect the fact that they're being involved in something like this? So not at all. In fact, in our district, we were actually we encouraged all of our schools to actually set up events for the children, because I, I think again, you know, one of the things that makes this country wonderful. I, I was born in Mexico. You know, my family came to this country when I was uh, five years old. And one of the things that I love about our country is that the reason it is where it's at is the best country in the world is because it's been individuals who have spoken up about change and at the right time made those changes. And all of us have benefited from that. And, I, and like I said, what I love is that in a time when there's so many polarizing conversations, here are our students 
who are standing up. So for me, I just, like I said, I just love the fact that I'm a superintendent at this time, that I can see that. And that's what I want our students to do about whether it's this issue, this issue about more children being able to attend college, graduate from college, issues around poverty, issues around mental health. And so for me, I think we need to learn. We need to learn from our students and listen to them. And they're all conversations we need to have. That's exactly all right. All those issues you're talking That's about. That's exactly right. Yeah. I'm going to give you the, you know, I went through the students and I let them, like, if there's one thing that you want people to take from this conversation, what would that be? Let's have conversations. Let's not get caught up on whether we agree, whether we're part of the same party, whether we're in the same village. Um, let's have the conversations. Let's listen to our young ones who actually, you know, they're seeing this through objective eyes. And, and, and let's talk about how we can responsibly make the right changes. And they may not, we may not all agree, but I believe we'll be a better society for it, we'll be a better country for it. Yeah. Chief McManus? Uh, I think we need to look at this a little more globally than, yeah. than again, as I mentioned earlier, just than just the schools. And we need to take the politics out of it. Um, if, if we don't take the politics out of it, we're never going to get anywhere with it. That's hard to do, though. <laughs> yeah. You might notice I didn't invi invite any politicians here tonight. <laughs> right. That was, that was on purpose because I think uh, no matter what side of the fence you're on, if you have a politician, people are going to make up their mind about them. I, I think there's a, there's a number of things that I think uh, we need to understand or at least put it out there so people can either choose to agree with it or not. And that is, um, you know, how much, how much more gun control do we need and is it going to do anything? Um, uh, that is a, is a political issue. Um, I think we need to get real serious about what makes venues secure versus what makes us feel better about putting up certain measures. But, but, but the, 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 the measures that would make schools or movie theaters or churches more secure is not something that's very palatable to people. Mm -hmm. at least not in this country, at mm -hmm. least not yet. Yeah. Johnny? Well, sticking with the active shooter uh, horses, uh, one of the things I want to make sure that people understand out there, uh, there's a lot of instructors that are offering active shooter courses. Be very careful and do your research and background. The particular type of course that I represent is from the state, that's so why I'm state certified. It's a curriculum that's nationwide in regards to the response and interaction with first responders. Um, make sure that they do their research, uh, and if they're going to do an active shooter course, uh, that they take a state certified, state sanctioned uh, course uh, that's going to be uh, something that they're going to come out with the uh, understanding and knowledge and interaction with law enforcement and uh, not just take a course that some guy just threw up and you know, has it out there. Yeah. That's, that, that's a danger. Something to think about. Yes. Yeah. Just because you can get into that course doesn't mean it's necessarily the course for you. That's correct. Yeah. All right. At this point, uh, I'm going to drive the camera, the photographers crazy here because I'm going to ask the students to come and stand behind you guys. Uh, there's some lights back there, so kind of be careful. Um, and as we wrap this up, and uh, Emily, you want to be part of this too? Did a great job, guys. I, I, I really want to thank each and every one of you for being part of this conversation because this is something that I thought about for a long time, having this conversation. How do we have this conversation? When do we have this conversation? Can we have a conversation where people aren't yelling and name calling and things like that? So I want to thank you all for being my partners in this and getting this across that we can have a civil, respectful conversation. Not only can we, I think we have to. So that's what I try to get done with these Spreester sessions. So I really appreciate you guys being part of this live one and thank you very much for being here. Um, and that's gonna wrap it up for our live stream right now. I wanna thank everybody uh, that's been at home and asked questions and made comments. Keep the conversation going and hopefully uh, we'll take the conversation forward from here. Have a good night, I'll see you on the night beat at 10.